Hi everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. And welcome to the seminar on higher education. My name is Ashad Ahmed and I really have the privilege of serving you as your AVP Teaching and Learning and Director of METL. We're really proud to co-sponsor today's event with the Office of the President and we're pleased to bring you an address by a thought-provoking philosopher, researcher, and academic developer of teaching and learning, Torgny Roxa. Like a scholarly Matt Sundin, <laughs> Torgny has joined us all the way from Sweden, and it has been an honor to welcome and host him this week. Now you can see the title of his talk is probably the reason why you're here. Um, and if you look at this title as I did, one of the words I thought that was rather provocative was uh, the word adrift. Um, perhaps because one might associate a drift with kind of lack of direction. But this afternoon I expect that Torgny will discuss universities that are perhaps, perhaps adrift, not because of a lack of direction, but because of a surplus of it. And this of course leads to a whole bunch of questions about why we are here in this university or any university, what, what is the role of a university and what are our roles that respond to the cultures that we inhabit and the needs that we try and meet. Uh, of course there are many, many possibilities to consider uh, as I'm sure Torgny will uh, about all of the multiple uh, stakeholders that exert their influence inside and outside our institutions. And so there's so many questions uh, about how do we weigh their competing influences? How do we value one direction over the other? So I think our speaker might explore some of these issues, but regardless of whether he does or not, I do know one thing, that he's certainly going to open our eyes and he's going to open our minds. And I guess I expect Torgny's lecture will make us think about our roles on a more, on a more personal level, uh, to examine our own motivations and, and perhaps uh, means in the way uh, we can change uh, our own uh, work and our own teaching to be more specific. Uh, on that regard, perhaps uh, he will inspire us to think of being better pedagogues or maybe remind us that we may be serving other goals. So these are very important issues and these are the kinds of issues that the President's Office and uh, METL hope to inspire when we invite internationally prominent thinkers like Torgny to our campus. So let me briefly introduce you, um, introduce him to you right now. Dr. Torgny Roxa is an academic developer in the Faculty of Engineering at Lund University in Sweden. He has won the Lund University Award for Distinguished Pedagogical Achievements, and he has been recognized as an excellent teaching practitioner. He has served as an external examiner for the Postgraduate Diploma in Learning and Teaching at Oxford University, and he is currently an honorary fellow at the University of Ulster. I have gotten to know Torgny through our mutual involvement with ISOTL. This is the International Society for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, an organization where he served as regional vice president of Europe. Most of all, those of us who know Torgny and his work, we are intrigued by the breadth of his imagination and the leadership that he inspires in working with colleagues on a range of issues that are most profoundly connected with how our students learn. So ladies and gentlemen, help me to thank Torgny for engaging so many of us throughout this week. Personally, thank you very much, Torgny, for your time, uh, your friendly disposition, especially, and for your tireless work to improve teaching and learning. Please give him a warm welcome. <clears throat> so, okay, thank you very much, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. It's always interesting for a Swedish person to go to Canada. Um, some of you might be interested in ice hockey, and uh, we contributed with a few players. 
uh, to the wonderful league you have over here. It's also interesting to stand over there and wait for, for the start. It, it took me back to uh, 10 years of my life. They ended some seven years ago. During those 10 years ago, then 10 years, I coached uh, three uh, girls teams in soccer. Uh, working with them, training them from they were seven up to they were 14. Uh, that was really interesting. But what I remember the most and what I sometimes really miss is the seconds before the game starts. You know, they're all out there on the field, they are standing there and they're waiting for the whistle. And that's where it all ends up. That's where it all sums up. We know all of us, me and the team and all the parents being there and everyone that after the game, we know whether we did it or not. But before we have no idea. So I s that was exactly what came back to me when I was standing over there waiting to begin this lecture. So it will be an adventure to see how it ends. Personally, I've been an academic developer now for 27 years at Lund University. I graduated uh, my bachelor's from Lund University, my master is from Griffith University in, um, in uh, Australia, and my PhD is from Lund again. Uh, I started off my bachelor in literature and sociology, and I now work with engineers almost only. Uh, I have no idea how that works. They seem to be able to communicate with people without math, which I'm grateful for. A uh, long time ago, I was in the, in the Swedish army for four, five, three, four, five years, something like that, because I grew up in an army family. So you, if sometimes if I do something like this, you know where it comes from. Uh, that's a typical sort of gesture in the army. Um, that will probably be the only thing that is left from that. <laughs> it's much more fun to be in a university for many, many reasons. We're not going into that. Uh, we, let's head off here. Uh, this is to give you some context of where I come from. This is my university, and you can see in the pictures there, there is always summer, <laughs> which is very strange. The academic year starts in September and ends in the end of May. So during the summer, there's almost no one there. The city is 100,000, and 40,000 of them are students, uh, more or less. So you imagine it becomes empty when it's summer, but even so, we continue to show the pictures. Uh, like it was that. The only university I've seen who is really true is the University of Helsinki. Because they had on their website uh, a picture taken from the sea. And you can see snowflakes floating around in the sea and everything is gray, gray, gray. And vaguely in the background you can see the silhouette of Helsinki there. I think those people are really brave and they are really going for the true stuff. Um, Anyway, so you see we found it in 66, 1666, we have that numbers. I'm working at the Faculty of Engineering. A little interesting detail here is that Lund University was founded as an imperialistic move by the Swedish king. We had just conquered this province from Denmark, and he thought we need to do this Swedish as quickly as possible. Let's put a university there. So it could remind us of the fact that universities have been used for many purposes in history. And we're living in an era which has been, it is, and it's going to be. So things change all the time. And mainly they change not because universities evolve like species, according to Darwin, but mostly because people change. Beliefs and doings and stuff. And we're going to come back to that. I've decided to divide my speech in four parts. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a drift. I'm going to give you a little bit of a theory of change. And the change I'm talking about here is change in teaching culture. Uh, we will come back to that. I'm going to give you a case and some numbers and some evidence. And then if we have the time, we're going to move down in the fourth, which I myself, of course, find the most interesting bit. But I thought we are not going to dig into the theory really from the beginning. We are just using a little bit of theory so we can move into the case. That's where we go. But we start by a drift. As Arshad told me this morning, that you can always decide which side of the bed you want to raise up every morning. No matter what conditions you're in, you can still decide small things. And that takes us into my second illustration, which is this. I'm going to read that for you in Swedish, and you can follow the somewhat bad English translation. So it goes like this in Swedish. 
Ensam i bräcklig farkost vågar seglaren sig på vida hav. Stjärnvalvet över honom lågar, nedanför brusar hemskt hans grav. Framåt så är hans ödesbud och i djupet bor som ut i himlen Gud. This is written as you can see 1838. This is in the middle of the heyday of the Humboldt University in Sweden. Uh, Humboldt started in Berlin, as you might know, early 1800, founded a, a university in Berlin. And that tradition he spaced, that's, oh. That's where we have academic freedom from as we know it. Freedom to teach and the freedom to do research and the academic freedom that we sort of have still in our university, it dates back from that. Before that, universities in Sweden were just voices from the king. They were teaching exactly what the king wanted them to teach. They were training priests and civil servants and law people, and they were all followers. So they were, you might say, an instrument of oppression. But from, from Humboldt again, from this era, we turned into where we live now in the universities. Some other things we just take for granted. They actually started somewhere. It's more to say about that because there are downsides and, and, uh, and positive sides of that. I hope you like the sound of Swedish, by the way. Yeah, this is the background thing. This is Stensaker overlooking Norwegian higher education. Uh, it's a, a, a decade of Norwegian higher education. He describes that mainly three pressures, three drivers for change have been in place in Norway. Uh, it's the, what he calls the professional. The professional is the, 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 what do you say, coming from the inside, the academics. They're, they're striving to improve their practices. That's what he calls the professional. The bureaucratic is mainly something put on top of the university, rules and regulations you have to follow, reporting you have to carry out, and, and academics usually today do a lot of reporting. I'm talking now, of course, from a Swedish and Scandinavian perspective, so maybe you have to, maybe it's not exactly the same, but I think you will recognize the patterns. The entrepreneurial is the kind of pressure put on universities where you release a lot of money from the government. You say, if you do this, you get a lot of money. But you have to do it in three years. Because the timeline among politicians is not as long, you know. So they might say, here you have five million uh, Canadian dollars, have to do this in three years. And timeline for universities seem to be slightly different than timelines for politicians. So it creates things and, and th yeah, pressure or demand inside the universities. Uh, Stensaker sums it up by, there is no learning going on between these three, he says. People engage in bureaucracy without thinking about practice. They engage in the entrepreneurial things without thinking about practice. And some of the professional development is also without thinking about practice. But what it most of all re uh, results in is a demand overload on, this, on the individual academics. Do more, do more, do more all the time. There is a, a woman, Field, who have written about the Tiger Mother University. Uh, that is, the Tiger Mother, as you might know, is the mother who thinks his, her, sorry, her child will be absolutely excellent in everything. It's written by a Chinese woman, but I can recognize these tiger mothers also in Sweden. Also the tiger fathers, they've been along for a long time. Uh, the thing is that there is no limit to the demands. And that's why Field talks about the Tiger Mother University. It's a place where you say to in your annual review, I taught four courses and I published five papers. And what you get back is, yeah, that's good. Next year you're going to teach five courses and publish seven papers. So it seemed to be sort of an endless series of more and more demands going on. I found this as a way of illustrating bureaucracy in universities. It ends in 94, but I think it's really interesting. Malcolm Tite did this meta study of all studies he could find in the English speaking world about how much administration each academic engaged in every week. 
And there you see it goes from 4.4 hours up to 16.5 hours per week in 94. And you could, of course, ask yourself, where has it gone from there? Uh, in Swedish, uh, oh, sorry, moving too fast. In Swedish, we have uh, numbers up to 2009, and it has not improved, I can tell you. It's gotten worse. Um, May I show you this, see what you think about this slide? This is actually inspired from Eleanor Ostrom, who got the Nobel Prize in 2009, when she talks about how we govern uh, practices in modern society. She is from political science. So basically what happens is that teachers are teaching, and then you're reporting, 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 and what comes down in the other end is money, 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 and the money is always adjusted according to something, according to government's ideas or other stakeholders' idea. It's not adjusted necessarily to the demands of the organization, but it's adjusted to the external stakeholders' idea about what the organization should do. So it's a way of influencing the organization. Another example is how leadership is, is developing in, uh, in higher education. More or less like leadership, as far as I know it in Sweden, we have developed leadership nowadays in academia, but mostly kicking and screaming because people have demanded it from us. It, hasn't, it has not really emerged from the academics. I never saw any sort of demonstrations with a lot of academics with placards and, and with shouting, we want leaders, we want leaders. That never happened. But somehow we now have leaders. So a way of illustrating that is that we somewhat have these leaders, or leadership, we're focusing on the structure here, on the phenomenon of leadership, but we also have a lot of other practices going on around us, and they have much more experience of leadership, and of course they offer their experiences as soon as they can, you know, yeah, you want, leader you want leadership in university, and the politicians might say, oh, we have politi political leadership here, this is how you do it, and, and the bureaucracy, no, this is how you do it, or military or sports or whatever, they all offer this, and we sort of, have so far taken in lots of this and tried it out and see whether it works or not. But it, what I would like to say is that we haven't really... Oh, no, why, why are we moving so fast? It should appear something else. There. We haven't really colored that leadership in blue colors. It hasn't really been an academic leadership. And mostly when we talk about leadership, actually, we talk about leaders of researchers, because that's where the money are. The leadership of teachers and teaching, it's much, much less developed. We have people sort of organizing and get it going, but we don't really have people leading that kind of organization. Even though we have lots of individuals trying, you have to think about two things here. What I'm saying here is not that we lack individuals who are trying to do things. We have that. But when they do things, they do it more or less despite the, the, the structures and the organization. They do it not because they are asked to do it often, but because they think they have to. So it's not an organizational leadership. It's an individual leadership where people take lead when they think it's necessary. So it's a rather bad story so far. And this is where we have this fun, wonderful picture of an egg here. So I would say we are immature teaching organizations. And we are immature as leaders of teachers. We do not really know how we should do that. But we probably have to develop our organizations because otherwise this external pressure might very well destroy a lot of the things around us. So we really have to do something. This is the adrift part. So you see, we are adrift, not because we don't know necessarily what we want as individuals, but all these external stakeholders, pressures, routines that are pressed upon us are doing things to us. And I think that we have to acknowledge and to work from there. Now, how do you do when you fight that kind of stuff? Well, If you, if, at, far, at least as far as I understand Foucault when it comes to discourses, and basically that's what we are talking about here, huge sort of ways of understanding the world that are sort of 
moving forward and influencing things. You cannot win against discourses by rationally critiquing them. If you go in and you try to rationally critique a discourse, you, it will just feed on it because it produces more knowledge about that discourse. So that discourse develops further, becomes stronger. The more we critique it, the stronger it becomes. In fact, you can even say that discourse is moving. They need critics in order to grow. So they nurture them. They need a few of them. So they give them more material to, to feed on. The way you do it, if you read Foucault, is to organize a counter discourse. You have to grow another, an alternative discourse. And that's the analogy with fighting fire with fire, to do a fire break. So basically, what I'm suggesting here, the best way to deal with these problems is to start to grow a discourse from within, which includes leadership, which includes the organization, which includes the academic values. So many if, most change, yeah, many, if not most, change in initiatives have failed in higher education. There is basically no limit to how much resources have been spent to develop higher education as a teaching organization, and then nothing happened. You give an academic, we did that for a long time in Sweden, we did give individual academics lots of resources, and they developed wonderful teaching. And it's documented, you know, these students being part of that, wonderful experiences, wonderful learning and personal development and everything. And then the funding stop and it sort of goes back again. We call it a rubber band effect. So the resources manage to pull the rubber band like this and wonderful stuff happens and then the funding ends and chuk, it's back again to what, what almost took, always took place. It's really strange how stable university teaching is. And again, again, we have, we have teachers developing new ways of teaching here and there all the time, all the time. Students being part of this development, driving this development, pushing for better teaching. And they do that and they manage to change a little bit, but the overall pattern doesn't really change at all. Which really needs attention. It seems to be a problem built in, the whole, in, in how we understand our own organizations. So we're going to use this. These are three lenses that you can use this for analytical purposes from John van Maan and we're in MIT here. So basically it's not problematic this. You can watch, you can look at the organization as a strategically designed organization. When you do that, you see budget flow and information and reporting and you, they always almost always written like boxes like this with sort of small lines in between. And that type of organization is always there because we want the organization to work fine and perfect. So we, listen, we adjust these all the time and we really try to get it going. And all organizations do that. It's not something that only we are doing. The organization as a political system, it, if we look through that lens, we will see all these groups pushing for agendas, trying to reach influence, trying to set the agenda for the future, controlling resources and all that. It also happens all the time in universities, as is in all, you know, in all organizations. Or you can look at the cultural system of the organization. The cultural system is basically a way of, of explaining it is it, what, teach, what persons, individuals do in their everyday interaction, the reality they construct by meeting each other and have small talk every day, the, the, the climate of a working context will probably be something we see through this cultural lens. I'm, I'm going to pursue the cultural lens from here. So you see, you see now where I'm going. I'm going to do something else so like this. There we are. I also thought that I would back it up a little bit with Popper, actually. Popper is not often used in, in our educational system. Scientists usually like Popper in science. Uh, and he's he been more influential, I think, than he is nowadays. But I, I, this is the book he wrote just after the Second World War. How many of you have read it? Is there anyone who have read it? Oh, thank you. Oh, of course. Um, so he wrote it after the Second World War, trying to figure out uh, how democracy might work and why it might not work. And he do it from a very ancient perspective, you might say, looking at the Greeks, Plato and those. 
It's a fantastic book, not, not the least because it's written in such a fluent style. It's just to read it, you know, you can read it when you, before you go to sleep in the evening. No problematic, it's just, but it's a huge piece of, of literature. So his idea is that it is the persistent, slow, and dialogous reform that make things happen. It's not revolutions. It's not the leaders. It's things that we do, and these are slowly changing. And over time, they, they prove to be remarkably different from what they used to be. And that is possible, he says, in democracy. The fine thing with democracy is that we have found a way to gradually change our institutions, he say. While in other systems, the only way to change the institutions is to do a revolution. And people usually get killed when you do revolutions. Uh, and that seems to be a waste, he thinks. So let's bring that into academic culture here. These are new professors in my university. They are just on their way into the university building to get the paper and the handshake from the rector, recognizing that, yes, you are now a professor. It's a grand day, and you can see here that they are really looking forward to this. <laughs> you can also see in all directions. So I find it to be a very nice illustration of academics here. Um, yeah, and he should maybe be happy. Um, <laughs> It might have to do that we have a surplus of critique in our organization. You probably have thought about that. We are excellent in critiquing each other. We train it all the time. So me as an academic developer working with academic teachers have found a secret weapon. And that is to give them, to praise them. To say, that, oh, that was interesting. That was really interesting. And they will tell you more about it. And you say, yeah, continue, do that, do that. And they will come back again because they want more praise because they don't get any praise any, anywhere else. <laughs> it's just sort of a deficit of it. So you can manipulate academic teachers by smiling and nodding and say, oh, yeah, that's wonderful. That, I, I like this. And they go away, oh, yeah. Like, because they are, you have to remember that. You know, Academics are people. <laughs> so, yeah, there is, basically, they are people. So. These authorities here, Schein, Kessar, and Clark, there are three of them. They have all of them written about organizational culture. Kessar and Clark are specialists in higher education. Um, you see there is a, something common between them. Schein talks about the importance of following the underlying assumptions of an organization. If you do that, it might be able to do something with organization. If you work contrary to that, it will probably fail. The same says Kessar. She calls it the ethos of the organization. It's very similar things here. Clark talks about the saga. And saga here means uh, it's, a, it's explicitly alluding to the Icelandic saga. The Icelandic saga was the things they wrote in the Middle Ages on Iceland. To, you might say to tell a story about families. What Clark says is that the saga stabilizes the organization. So if we're standing now here, we're standing here and we're looking forward, we have also constructed a saga about ourselves. And that saga will give limits to what we can do in the future. It's not the history of ourselves, it's what we choose to construct. The stories we tell, that will be the saga. If we want to change this organization, we probably have to reinterpret the saga. We cannot sort of go in this direction with one saga and then go in this direction with the same one. We have, to talk, we have to talk about it. We have to talk about different things, lift different things up, highlight different things in our own history to make that happen. That's what Clark says. So I put up, yeah, put up some academic values there, which I think is probably part of our ethos, uh, underlying assumptions, and uh, the saga we have. There are probably more of them, you know, but they seem to be central. Academic freedom, collegiality, peer review, the discipline, and critical thinking are these things. The critical thinking comes out different in different disciplines, I've noticed. Humanitist people do critical thinking sort of in a, what you might say a dramatic form. They are sort of ready to question everything if they have to, which, and they are good at that. Uh, engineers, they don't question everything, but they are really good at questioning procedures. Sort of, this is a machine, it works like this, and it gives this outcome. How can I make that better? 
So they chit -chit 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 run sort of uh, very quickly here to optimize the whole processes. But what we learn from the engineers in my faculty is they very rarely question their own basic assumptions. It almost never happens. They are like running forward because it's so successful without looking backwards much. While the humanities often look backwards. So uh, critical thinking is a tricky thing. It doesn't look the same in the entire university. But in, nevertheless, the, we need these five. And we also have a good practice called research. Research seems to be very productive. And even though you might say that the government and others are now buying research and doing things with research, they are shifting the funding from one end to the other and doing things with the community. But nevertheless, the research culture as a culture is really effective. It generates enormous amount of activity and practice and refine itself to a degree which could hardly be foreseen 200 years ago. And we have all these wonderful tools. We have Google Scholar and other search tools that we can find. I have this problem, let's search for something, and poof, comes up, oh, there was someone in New Zealand doing that. That was interesting. I had no idea that person existed. Other, thing, other wonderful things with research is that if you want to become a researcher, the first thing you have to do is to look what the others have already done. Uh, before, you're a, if, before you're allowed to add to it. So it's a very normal, it's a, a very strong norm in research cultures that you yourself have to check what the others have done. Think about that norm coming to play in teaching cultures. Have you seen that in teaching cultures? You know, the imperative that if you are changing your exam, your form for exam, you have to check what the others have done first doesn't happen often. Uh, we are still in the fact when we fund development in teaching, we sort of fund it and then we say, when you're done, you have to disseminate, we say. Right? You have to disseminate. So we are still on the sending end of this norm. We haven't really got onto the receiving end yet. So there we have things to work on. This is now closing in on teaching here. So we believe, I believe, that quality comes from a slow, steady change. And it's not, you, it has to be informed. It's not OK just to have an opinion about teaching. Is that OK in this university? Is it OK to have, just have an opinion, to engage in a discussion by just saying, well, I think. I think a four-hour exam is absolutely the best way to test the, the students in this group. Is that OK? Uh, because it wouldn't, wouldn't be OK in research, would it? We had a little story then from our philosophy department. We have a wonderful professor in cognitive science whose name is Peter Jerdenfors. Peter Jerdenfors. He's a, sort of the, the hero of that place. And they have teaching and learning seminars. And the story goes like this. That on one occasion they started to have a discussion with the young teachers who have been to teaching and learning courses and workshops. They started to discuss with him, you know, Peter, is it really okay to just have these four hour exams in the end of the course? Shouldn't we do coursework or, or peer review or something during the course which might result in more learning during the assessment? And he said, no, 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 he said, you can't do that. You know, we always done and we always will, he said. And suddenly there was one of the doctoral students, and this is probably the click where things change who said to him, well, you know, Peter, I hear what you say, and you heard what we said. We have these references backing us up. Where are your references? And he's a clever guy. So what he said was, hmm, I'll be back, he said. So three weeks later, the discussion came up again. He maintained the idea of a four-hour exam, but he now had references to back him up. So you might say nothing happened, and I would say everything happened. Because we went from having an opinion to having an informed opinion. It doesn't mean that informed opinion always ends up in what I think is the right thing to do, but at least it is informed. And from that, from that time, it was not okay in that place to just come in and claim something about teaching. You have to back it up somehow. And that is what I mean by learning from the research culture here. <coughs> So we have done that, yeah. Here's another thing I find important. 
This is a book coming out 2001. It's called Academic Tribes and Territories. I'm not sure whether you've seen it. I've, I, I wanted a, a picture here on tribe. I wanted to call it Academic Tribes, like the book there, but I wanted people in it. So I searched on Google for tribe and images. And I got a hundred of images of people living in, in the, the South Pacific or, or in Africa, looking in ways that we would, in a bad language, call primitive. There wasn't a single picture on academics. <laughs> I find that strange. Uh, this book is about research cultures. And the idea is that academic tribes and territories allude to the fact that uh, the territory is the discipline, all right? The discipline. And the, the tribe are the specific people inhabiting that discipline in a specific context. And that becomes a small culture. And they decide, this is what we do here. This is how we do things. And there is a culture emerging from it, a very local one. They also say in this book that... Uh, when you do research, we rely on two networks, one large and one very small. And you can compare that with your own research. Um, the large one is global. It could be hundreds and hundreds of people. We use that for orientation. Where are we? What are we going? Where are we? Am I doing the right thing? And so on. But then we also have a very small network. The small network are the people that we test our first drafts where we have our first ideas and we sit down over a coffee or something and try that. Is this, could this be, could this be something? And that's sort of the birth of what later might become a research article or a book. And that small network, they say, is around 10 people, not more than that. So Katarina Mortens, my colleague and I thought, would that apply also for teaching cultures? Because they don't say anything about that. So here's a question to you. Take a half a minute, each of you, and think about, and if you're not teaching, think about what you do professionally or you find important, important practice. But if you teach, think about your teaching. How many individuals do you really talk to about teaching? When I say really talk to, it means not chatting, you know, not necessarily only complaining, but talking about sort of wonderful things happening or a problem occurring or a new idea or something. How many are they? Half a minute. So, okay, how many of you have uh, thought about uh, a number which is 12 or more? Hands up. One, two, three, all right. How many of you thought about a number between 8 and 11? Okay. How many of you were between uh, 4 and 7? Okay, less? No. Some, yeah, good. Uh, I will not ask how many of you have no one to talk to. <laughs> the, what we found was this. So we found that the number of conversational partners per respondent was 3.5 or 7.4. That means that if they consider their own local culture to be supportive, they had 7.4. If they thought their culture were, their local place were hostile to these conversations, they had 3.5. And uh, you can see indiscipline or not indiscipline there. This research, was, we published that in 2009. It has been replicated with English academics, with American academics, and with Finnish academics and Australian academics. And it all comes out more or less the same. So it seems to be the case that academic teachers talk to a selected few. When we ask them to describe these conversations, um, they told us that they were doing that in the office, in the car. In Australia, they did it at the water cooler. That's where they meet in Australia, obviously. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we meet over coffee because that's warm. Um, but it was always hidden, you know, always private, always with those people I knew I want to talk to. One of the stories was, yeah, this from religious studies. Yeah, I wanted to talk to her about this, so I went to the coffee room, but she wasn't there, so I just walked away again. It's a sign of a person who wants to talk about something, and I want to talk to that person, so I come there, but she's not there, so I have to wait. 
It's not the fact that she's not there, so I told it to someone else. No, no, you don't do that. Some of these stories was, I meet this person, this man, twice a year in a conference. That's when I talk to him. One of our teachers in computer science told us that I don't talk to anyone here. I would never do that. He was somewhat sort of, um, well, it was a bit like this about it. Uh, he said, I wouldn't talk to anyone here, but at MIT, I have two people with whom I discuss teaching. <laughs> so it comes again and again and again, the fact that these academic teachers know exactly who they discuss teaching with for real, right? So if we do that, if we take that and we put it out in, in, in a graphical form, we'll do that here. They are all teachers. They are stars deliberately, you know. Fine. So we choose one of them. See now what happens. So we put in his or her significant others here. Significant others to tell you that the significant others are those people among all the people that you allow to influence yourself. You see how that works? I mean, there are hundreds of people, you meet them, many, many of them, but they are not having the same value, all of them. Some of them, when they say something, you listen. In universities, it's perfect to see if you give away a reference, we have rituals for that. So we give away a reference and you say, oh, thank you very much, and I'm not significant for you, you will put it on the pile with things that you're going to read when you have the time. And that will never happen. But if I was your significant other, I'd say, I think you should read this. You would read it the same evening. That's the difference. That's significant others are important people to us. So the, this person has four of them. And in those conversations there, that's where the teaching and learning reality is defined, constructed, and maintained in conversation. If I come back, I go to a workshop in teaching and learning, and I come back and tell my significant others, you know, we were all wrong, you know, we have to do it like this. They would look like me, well, what's wrong with you? I mean, no. And then talk to each other and say, oh, we, we wait a while and we'll settle down, you know, he will come around to it again and see the reality again. So we are working with each other like this to maintain similarity all the time, because that is really good for us. It's good for this sort of muscle up here because we don't have to waste energy to find new people all the time. I thought I knew you and here you come back and say you're totally different. Oh, how do you know? We don't do that. We say, no, shape up, you know, come around, be yourself as you used to be. That's how we do it. And it's not only academics, you know, all people do that. If we now put more of them in here and you will see what happens in this teaching organization here. In each and every one of these interactions, that's where reality is constructed, right? And if you put many of them, you get a huge network, a complex network of relationships. And in each and every one, it is decided what is right or wrong. So if the provost releases a, a policy in this system, the meaning of this policy will be negotiated in each and every one of these so there will appear a number of versions of these policy. And they can then discuss among themselves, is it like this, is it like this? And once it turns out over the timeline, it's released here and it moves on, moves on, moves on. And over here, we start to look for an effect of that policy. It will emerge in a number of varia variations. There will be lots of different practices as a result of that. So you see, if you look at this organization as a car factory, it will be very different. If you introduce a change over here, you re reprogram the computers and something, and you hit the bottom, and you wait, choom, everything would just be working like that. If we go to the Second World War, there was a, an American general called Patton. Have you heard about him ever? Yeah. He, he has done one of the most amazing things in the whole military army, he, 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 military history. He, he turned around an entire army that was on the way into over the Rhine and into Germany, and there was this sort of offensive up in whatever it was, then, yeah, something, December 44. And he managed in two, three days just to turn them 90 degrees and upwards. That's what an army can do. Academics cannot do that. Because we believe in personalized, complex bodies of knowledge. Okay, so this is how we should depict the organization. It's from Hannah Lester, so it's not only for universities, but it's for knowledge-intensive organizations. So we have a micro level where we have the individuals. We have a meso level where we have these knowledge networks. Clusters of people constructing their reality for themselves.
And then we have the macro level with the managers and the society and everything. So if we want to understand, we believe, the teaching organization, we should focus on the meso level where reality is constructed among teachers. And that's what we have done. So you might say that it's all about the teachers, this talk. I know that teaching and student learning at university really is about students because that's where we measure the outcome of what we do. But here we are trying to influence the teachers. And these are ordinary academic teachers. Let's move into the case here. So we're back at LTH. That's the Swedish for uh, Lund Tekniska Högskola. Can you do German? It's Lund Technische Hochschule. Uh, it's a faculty of engineering. And I go straight into the measures we've done. So we've been doing this for 20 years, and what so far we reached this. Every year they do a youth barometer in Sweden. They are asking a survey bet, uh, for young people between 17, 18, and up to 24. And among them, our faculty comes out at the top when it comes to be associated with educational quality. We don't know how that happened, but we see that it has happened. We know that because we ask all of them. Education quality is the prime reason for new students to choose our faculty. We are gaining market shares. Uh, uh, market shares here I mean that if you look at the, in Sweden it's like you go into a website in Stockholm and you choose an education and a place to study that. And of course the first choice you make would probably be your first determined choice. That you can fill in seven others, right? And if you enter into the education of number seven, maybe you're not that motivated to do that. You're more motivated to, for your first choice. And what we see is that more and more people going into engineering choose our faculty, meaning that our competitors get lesser of these first uh, hands. And we know that. And we know the student appreciation of what's called good teaching, we measure that, I'm going to show you later, is increasing. It's going up. So something is happening. And we know that other institutions are following what we are doing and they are inspired by it and introducing the same thing. RSA down there, do you know where that is? That's the Republic of South Africa. The others are Uppsala, Umeå, Halmstad, Ebro, there are cities in Sweden. Finland, that, you know where Finland is. It's a small country up there just between us and Russia. Uh, and Denmark, very close to the West. So this is our numbers of student experience. We measure it through one thing called Course Experience Questionnaire. Course Experience Questionnaire is a research-based uh, formula uh, or survey instrument which is supposed to indicate whether courses are, uh, are supporting deeper approach or understanding among students or whether it is supporting memorization and studying only for the exam basically. This is a very short summary. So it's going up. It looks dramatically, but you have to remember that the scale is from minus 100 to plus 100, so it's not really that dramatic. But the numbers are huge, so we are definitely going up here. And it's steadily co continuing to do that. I said that they, they choose us because of the educational quality, and here are the numbers for that from 95, 2002, and 11. So the green one is they tick the box, you know, why did you choose Lund? And in 95, 26% of them tick the box educational quality. And now there are 82 of them doing that. Another thing, I said that we are working with the teachers, sort of how they talk about teaching. So we have a campus conference. Why isn't it? Oh, something is lost there. So this is a conference we do every second year. So we have 25 papers, 100 participants. You see, that is conference. That is what people do at conferences. It just looks the same as everywhere. So what we did was to go in and look in the proceedings. Are the proceedings changing over time? Do they become better? Because there is no support for writing a proceeding. They sit in their office and write the proceedings themselves. Focus on student learning. You can see the black one going up compared to 2003, the gray one there. So that, yeah, that is going in the right direction. 
They reintegrate research in their articles. Yes, it's going up. And they write better. And these are engineers. You have to remember that. These are engineers writing about education to each other. 1,300 words. That's about three pages. We use 10 points times in two columns because that's how engineers do it. We even have a template from IEEE, which is a huge computer science conference. The humanities people have copied this strategy, so they have their conference. They have 4,000 words and double space. They also have flowers on the cover. <laughs> yeah, we usually we smile about that. But you know, it, it's not really important. Because humanities people write in a different way. Engineers do research and then they report. It becomes very short and effective, you might say, in delivering the information. While humanities people use language and writing to, act, to actually do the investigation as they write. There is a discussion going on often in that. So the only difference is what is appearance. The function of these two conferences is just the same. This is now I'm going to show you a model that we use. And this is a model we show our, all our teachers. It is included in our promotion papers. We require from our teachers to focus on teaching. The teaching up there is the teaching practice. And that is everything they do, you know. It's not just lecturing. It's going on field trips, writing feedback, uh, doing exam question instructions, whatever. Everything, answering emails even. Everything this have effect on student learning. That is teaching. But to improve that, we think they have to be able to observe what's going on. So the observations of teaching are really important here. The theory means, do I understand my observations? And then you have to replan. And if you move that around a couple of times, we think that, yeah, quality will increase. That will be better. It would be stupid. It, unless, I mean, you observe, you find things and you understand that and you replan and then you teach the same way you did before. That would not happen. So things, things are moving here. Yeah, we'll skip that one. We call it pedagogical competence. That's what we ask for. And unless you can show pedagogical competence, you cannot be a professor in our faculty. Unless you show that, you cannot be promoted. It hasn't been like that all the time, but it is like that now. They also have to go public, at least sometimes with this. Because if they are not influencing their colleagues, it's not good enough. They have to at least show their colleagues what they are doing. It's a dissemination bit again. I would love to have in there, in order to be promoted to to professor, you have to show that you have looked for other examples before you reform your teaching. But we haven't reached that far yet. Yeah, so it takes time. It takes a long time to do that. I'm going to show you a timeline now. This is the timeline. How much time is that? What you see here are things we have done. And the timeline starts from 1990 and ends today. You have 2010 here, up there. So we have an academic development unit. We have academic development activities. We have the Pedagogical Academy, which is a fantastic reward system, which is not included in my speech. But people get a raise in salary, a diploma, and their department get extra money if they pass this assessment. That's when you, they become excellent teaching practitioners. That's, that's the diploma. It looks like it's big like this, and you're supposed to put it on the wall. It's, when I grew up, all the hair, you know, the men cut, cutting my hair, very short they did, uh, in this, what is that called? It's not a hairdresser, you know, these old places. Is it a shave, you know, the, where men used to go and cut their hair? Sorry, barbershop. Oh, barbershop, thank you. And um, if you've been to a barbershop, you remember that they all have their diplomas hanging there. And that's the model we use. Because we figure that academics, if they have gained this, they want to show other people they have it. And they do. They put it on the wall. And we, if we move around in the faculty, we have a, a, around 110 of these rewarded teachers. We can see these diplomas hanging up there, really nice. 
Academics are strange people. Uh, or maybe not so strange. We all like appreciation and, and showing off sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that is important. We used to say we have done three deans during this time. Do you remember what I said about persistence? One dean is not enough. So I would say any dean entering into this system and say, I'm going to make a mark in three years in here, I would say, go home and read the literature. It will not happen. Because that's what the dean would do, you know, if the dean is from mechanics or biology or literature coming in and I would go to him and say, you know, all these rubbish of mechanics, you know, this wouldn't work. He would just say, go home and read the literature. You don't understand anything about this. And I would say that to the dean because it takes time. It takes a long time to, to ripple out in these networks and these conversations and making a change. So we've been lucky. All these four deans have actually believed in this. Ah, lovely. It's, I, I think I have 25 more minutes. Is that correct? Or do you want to go home? Uh, that's, that's a tricky question. I would be surprised if everyone said yes and left, but that's okay. Um, okay, so now we're going to go move into the more theoretical part. Remember this picture? Uh, before we go into this, I want to use Eleanor Ostrom again here. There are developmental fallacies, problems, pitfalls to fall in, and here are two of them. What I call a bureaucracy problem. The bureaucracy problem in reforming these kind of organizations is that you go into the organization and you find best practice. These guys over here are really good. That's best practice. Now everybody has to do that. That would be awful. That would be really bad. Because you would destroy all the variation, all the perfect things that are going on. The other one is the market. Let's increase the competition between these. But the problem with markets is that it doesn't produce variation. It produces similarity. So it wouldn't help. Because whatever you do in market, you have to have some kind of gain. And as soon as you find a gain, you know, this is what we aspire for, all the competitors would look at each other and try to do the same in order to gain that. It's more or less like looking at TV. Uh, and look, you know, sitting there and, what do you say? I tried to find a Swedish word, we, we click, zap, we zap. Do you zap? Is that what you do? We zap. Are you zapping today? I'm zapping. Uh, so you're zapping through the channels on TV and you try to find something which is not similar to something else. And you just zap and zap and zap. Between eight and, ten, eight and nine in the evening, people sit and talk. Or they cook. That's about the variation we have in Swedish television. Um, they cook a lot on TV nowadays. Do they do it here as well? Oh yeah, they cook, yeah. Imagine if you eat all that food they cook. That would be <laughs> really bad. Yeah. Because the, the principle here, before we go into the microcultures, the principles here, and this is Ostrom's words, is that if it works, if they work, they are specifically adapted to that context where they operate. And if you, if you aspire a high degree of sophistication, they will adapt even more. What comes out of this is, of course, that they will vary. They will be different. They have to be different. And that's why the bureaucracy idea is so wrong. That's another space movie, by the way. Uh, I forgot what that's. We were so wrong. Yeah, we don't, we don't go into that. Um, I can't remember the, no, we don't give it, we don't. Next thing then, for you to do, think about a good place here in this university or wherever you've been, a, a university. Think about a good place you know. What I mean by a place could be a research group, a disciplinary community, a small department, could be part of a department, could be a place where you basically meet people every day. Right? But it's good. You like it, they're producing good stuff, excellent research, excellent teaching, like that. Think about that if you know one of those. And turn to the person sitting next to you and try to tease out why is it good. 
I mean, I'm serious now. You're supposed to talk to each other, okay? <laughs> Tease out why are the good place a good place. You get three minutes to do that. Start talking. I would like uh, to hear something from uh, four places in the room. So four little extracts of your discussion. Let's, let's start over here somewhere. Anyone here would like to share something? Yeah? Sure. You're being pointed at. All yeah? Right. Uh, I was thinking of where I did my master's degree, which was a, a university in the north of Italy um, that was only did graduate degrees in earthquake engineering, which is my field. Um, and the professors would come from all over the world to teach us. Uh, and the students stayed there. We got to know each other well. We were from all over the world. Um, and so the passion of the professors who were coming for that one month time where the only thing you were doing was taking their course uh, created an environment where we could learn. And because we were all living together as well, um, just uh, created a really special. So if you, see, you used the word passion. So that, that seems to be important here. OK, thank you very much. Do we have something from over here? Sure, so if I can say something. So I think I was mentioning, I'm a mathematician, so almost an engineer in some ways. And uh, um, what I like is we've got in our building, it's a very nice building, and it was designed to encourage interaction. And there's a cafe right by the front entrance. And I like to go there and have a coffee. Sometimes I'll meet someone there, but usually people come by and they'll sit down and you'll talk about research or teaching or see a student and I think I like this kind of informal well, interaction. Okay, so uh, sort of a coffee area yeah. around, yeah, where people come and go and are invited and is allowed to come and you can chat for a while and then, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So what would be back here, back three, some, yeah, we have a volunteer. Yeah. But just before you start talking, I'm going to ask someone back there next and I would just want to say we have three men now. Okay. So, yeah, please. <laughs> Can you speak up a little bit? Okay. So it seems to be a good thing to invite students to take part of the knowledge and then form their own position, their own opinions. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much. So now, what do we have back there? So we're sort of like this little group of art guys over here. Yeah. And we were talking about our inquiry classes and how we feel it's like a really good mix of research and teaching. So they're generally smaller classes, they're pretty self-directed, but you also like facilitate a lot of discussion and it's not so much someone lecturing at you, but um, like creating connections and interacting with mentors. And, so it's uh, self-directed more or less, you, you're a group and you can direct yeah, yourself. You and you like yeah. work with, um, with your professors and it's more collaborative and also there was like research involved to create a new inquiry course which just started this year. So, like, Sounds amazing. I wish I was part of that. Uh, yeah. So what we did, Katarina and I, was went out going to study five of these wonderful places we have in our university. And I'm not going to go in detail with this uh, study before, because it would take too long. But you see, the, that's the report over there. And one thing, that, uh, several things, and among these we can see that these good places, what we did was to interview the leaders, the middle people, you might say, and the newly appointed, often doctoral students. And then we ended off with a focus group with students, so we can see that the, the picture matched, right? And one thing that came across was that these places knew where they were going. Uh, they had a direction formulated by themselves. So when you say passion and you say self-directed and things like that, they, they had this passion going somewhere. And I tell you about the, the, the going somewhere, what that was. One of these places were, were 80 academics, including doctoral students. They wanted to reform the Swedish industry. 
That was their passion. Uh, we have another place. There were 11 academics. They wanted to change the society. We also had one who wanted to change the profession they were training for. See, my point here is that the passion they had was for things way ahead. You know, from a management perspective, it seems ridiculous going out to people and ask them, I want to know what you want to achieve, and I want to know when you have achieved it, and who did it, and who reported where, and we want the measurement numbers to see if we are proceeding in that. What do you really want? We want to change society. I mean, you see, it doesn't fit. It doesn't go together. That's what I mean. There is, a, there is an external management culture coming into university asking for things which is more or less pointless for the academic cultures who are really good. So we have to find other ways of doing this. It's also very clear that they trusted each other immensely inside. They were shifting research funding to, you know, we actually heard that. One guy said, well, my colleague over there got five million kroners for research, but he, could, he didn't have time to do it, so he gave it to that person instead. And they were also sending an administrative person to Italy to collaborate with someone down there because there was no one else who could go. So, so this kind of trust in each other came across all the time, all the time, all the time, and they were really happy to be there. When we went from there, we both like football and soccer, so when we, when we went away from one place and talked to one of the new ones, uh, we said it was like talking to a person who loved football and has now come to Barcelona or Real Madrid. He's not allowed to play, but he can have the dress and sit on the bench. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Sort of this happened, I'm in this place and I want to be here. That's the passion we, we got out of this. Another thing we found was that it was strictly hierarchical. So again, we started to ask questions about academic freedom. What is academic freedom? Academic freedom seems to be okay to be fit into a pyramid of hierarchy and be happy about it, right? So academic freedom cannot mean that I'm loose from every influence. I'm on my own. That would be wrong. It's something else. So when we discuss academic freedom in the future, we should take in mind that lots of academics can experience academic freedom, even though we can see that they're hooked up in the hierarchies and status problems. Even despite that, they, they feel free. And of course, there is a wonderful uh, essay about freedom by Isaiah Berlin. He was an Oxford professor in the 60s, where he talks about freedom as, an, as, a, as a problematic interaction between two sides. One side is, I'm free to do whatever I want without interference. I'm also free to express myself. The problem, Berlin says, if I express myself, I interfere with others' ability to be without interference. You see how that works? If I, if I feel free here to go and knock the head of our shad here, that's my self-expression. I will most certainly interfere with his, his freedom, wouldn't I? And that comes across all the time. So freedom is an, in, it's an interactive thing, which is much more problematic than we usually talk about academic freedom. Comes across. They also have this developed saga. We ask them, can you tell us what happened? Why did you become like this? And in one place they said, you know, yeah, there was this professor, Carl Johan Ostrom, his name is. He founded this place in, in the early 60s. And he put in place this belief in what we are doing now, and we still follow that. And there he is. He was just walking by in the corridor. He's 87. Uh, he's still around. One of them, we asked him, how, does, how long does it take to become like this? And they said, well, a hundred years? That was the philosophy department, uh, because philosophy has been around all the time. That's a wonderful place, the philosophy department in our, in our university. So I just wanted to highlight a few things about this, to give you the sense of how they operate these. They are hugely collaborative. They have an immense belief in something in the far future. And they operate through internal communication, which is really effective, and they are extremely aware of their history while doing this. Those are the good places. So it's not enough, is it? We need to know more about the microcultures. What do the bad ones look like? But we haven't really come around to, to doing the same study with them. 
because it was really nice calling these people up and say, you, we heard they are, you are so good. Could we come and study why you are so good? That was easy to do, but the, other, the opposite would be really hard, you know? <clears throat> calling you up and saying, you know, we heard you have a lot of problems and nothing is really working. Could we come and study how that operates? Well, we can't do that. So we have to go through other means to do that. So we go through, because we, that's who we are. We go through theory to try to find ways of, of describing uh, uh, variation. And Eleanor Ostrom is a really good role model here because she studied places where people took collaborative responsibility for a limited resource. She got the Nobel Prize for this research and, you know, that stuff, you, it really comes across to you that it's not every research that gets the Nobel Prize. Sometimes you really need to do something really extra. I recommend her reading her books very much. She's not around anymore, which is a great pity. But she defined nine design principles that even though these places are very different, they follow the same principles. And here they are. Eight they were. They all have clearly defined boundaries. They know who is in and who is out. Okay? The rules or norms they have are really adapted to the specific requirements of the context where they operate. Really important. All the members can modify these rules all the time. It dis it discuss that. They also respected by managers, we might say, to cut it short, to do this. The managers do not interfere, but they exert pressure on them. You know, it's like being, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. But not sort of, this is what you should do. That's wrong, you know. Not, oh, so manage yourself. That would also be wrong. Managers need to be there and show the, it's like raising kids, actually. Um, graduate system of sanction is available. It means that when people violate the norms, they are sanctioned, they are things, punishment given to them. But the punishment is adapted to the very locality of the crime. She talks about, there was a peasant in Tokyo, you no, know, in Tokyo, in Japan, there was a number of villages taking care of a wooden area, and this, this peasant took too much timber out one year, and if you do that, you will ruin the whole place. So they wanted to punish him. He went, they went to him and said, we know you have a sick son, and he, he needs to go to hospital, so we understand why you took that timber. Don't do it again. But there was also a rich guy doing it, and they went to him and said, you're not allowed to take any timber out for 10 years. So you see, because you have this local knowledge, you can actually give sanction to people, which is not the same for all crimes. It's adapted to the circumstances in there. Really interesting to think about how that operates, how that works. I'm going to show you another way of describing variation. Here we have have it as a function of trust and share responsibility. Think about the place you thought about a couple of minutes ago. So we claim that if you trust each other, if you talk a lot to each other and trust each other and you have a shared ex experience of shared responsibility for what we are doing, we are doing, that's the thing, you know? It's a shared responsibility for us, for what we produce here. That would mean a variation, and uh, we call them the commons, the market, the club, and the square. Uh, easy to see the square, perhaps. We don't have a shared responsibility, and I don't trust you. It's like entering into a square and asking, oh, well, who are these people? I don't really know. We have these places in our university. <coughs> Departments where people live together for years, and they never talk to each other. They never interfere anything. They never do anything together. They just coexist. They're, they may be bleak places that I don't want to work in. The club are these places where you trust each other a lot, but you don't share responsibilities. So the result is you tell anecdotes to each other all the time and nothing happens. The club means the kind of English gentleman club, Chesterfield, chairs and smoking a cigar and say, well, I was a part of this. And the other says, yeah, I understand. It's a problem, isn't it? It's awful. So blah, blah, blah. And nothing happens. The market is when you have a shared responsibility, but you don't trust each other, so you need contracts. 
You can do that, but it's somewhat stiff to do that because if you want to adapt to certain specificity, you have to renegotiate the contract. And that takes too much time when you're in the classroom. When you're in a classroom, you have to teach according to what is going on with the students. You have to adapt to what's going on. If that means, wait, wait, wait you're 22 of you, but sit still. I'm going to ask the study director whether it's okay to say no to you. I mean, you can't do that. So you have to do that immediately. And in the market, that would result in, I do it, but I don't tell the others. So the result is that I have a, a, a number of contracts but people are not following them because they are not suited for the specificities of the situation. So that's a weakness in the market. The commons, that are a place where you trust each other and you share responsibility. But the trick here is, if that is a conservative place, if that is a place we know how to teach and we trust each other and we know why we do it like this, so we will never change, that becomes a problem in an organization. Sooner or later, so you have to add a developmental dimension to this. Do each and every one of them develop? The square might be a hugely developmental place. We organize academic conferences, and I can, my first conference I went to, I didn't know anyone. I could play anything, you know. I put on the play, I am a researcher from Lund University. Yeah, I'm doing this. And, and no one could critique me. So the others met me like, oh, you're a researcher. That was interesting and treated me as a researcher. So yeah, I, I got a hang of it, you know, yeah. That was very developmental for me, but it was not really true. But that's something you can do in a square. You can try out a new identity. You can, you can play something and say, can I do this? Yeah, I could do, yeah, I could do this. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm, a visit, I'm, I'm playing the game of visiting scholar at McMaster in Canada, and you don't know me, so I'm... Who is talking to really? You will never know that. <laughs> Sorry. So this is what we have done. This is what we have done, and this is how we operate. So what I've told you now is a need to do these things. Remember the egg that is actually like this? That could be our organizations, right? I told you a little bit how we operate in doing this and the outcomes of it. And I told you a little bit further on the theory we use when we try to understand these microcultures and how they operate. Any questions? No, no, we don't do it like that. Uh, we have uh, two more minutes. So take half a minute and look at the person sitting next to you and formulate a question in each pair. Do that. I've been in the military. Come on, <laughs> get going. One question each. Each pair, one question. Okay, sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but we're running short of time. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask a comment three questions. So let's start over here. Please. We all um, happen to be thinking about your slides about students' response to Lund. Um, to Lund. The, 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 yeah? Exactly. And we had sort of... Um, Two questions in a way. We were curious about whether you ever asked students what quality of education means to them. Um, and connected with that, we were, some of your bar graphs showed the slides for quality of education and others showed reputation. Yeah. We don't necessarily think that those are the same thing. That is really true. So there are a lot of things behind this. When it comes to asking students about quality of education, the answer you get back is depending on the conception they use while, while looking at education. And some students, the most common ones, is some students are using a deep approach conception about what it all is about, and some are using a, a transmitting surface approach conception. And if you ask them, these people will say totally different things about quality than these things. We have done that kind of inquiry, and others have done that, and that is invested in the, in the course experience questionnaire. But it could be done again, yeah. And something we are doing right now is to try to increase our collaboration with the student union. They are happy about what we are doing, but we want them to be a more active part of that. Inspired by people here in North America, especially Peter Felton and Cathy Bouvilli in Scotland, we're trying to move that way. So yeah, sorry, that's a comment. Okay, something back here? Oh, I'm gonna come back to you. No, there we are, thank you. I knew it would come, yeah. I'm not very familiar with what happens um, with academics as far as if there's team building or retreats or anything. Are there any mechanisms in place to actively work on things like trust and shared responsibility? 
there are quite a lot actually. Uh, I mean, at home, and I'm sure here, uh, departments and sub departments go on retreats and discuss things. They try to fix it. There are lots of things where you try to work on these things. So, so we shouldn't uh, underestimate the effort. But I would say that there is not much in the organization which actually reward the development of these things. So there are individuals who try to create this, and sometimes they are very successful in doing that. But once they did that, there is not really anyone who is interested in it. In fact, when we asked deans and program directors, even student union leaders, about where are these good places, no one could answer that. They didn't know. But they all said, we are, we are, I think we, we interviewed 11 or 12 of them, and, and all of them said, if you asked me about the problems, I would know it directly. So it, seem, it seems like our organizations currently are geared towards problems and chaos and putting out fires. But everything we know about how to develop people, how to develop teams, how to develop organizations is that you have to acknowledge the good things. Otherwise, they will not have the energy to work on those things that are not working. But currently at my university, we are blind for good things. And that I would say, so you see, people are doing good stuff but the organization doesn't work to acknowledge that, which is a big problem for us. Okay, one more. <laughs> At the same time. Yeah, please. Um, I was wondering, at the beginning you talked about kind of the increasing administrative burden yeah. that professors have. So how do you kind of get around that as a constraining factor on all of this and in kind of improving pedagogy? Yeah. Whew. Well, I could answer that in many sort of levels, uh, and I would choose one of them. I think the demands coming from, from external demands on us to do all this reporting comes from the fact that these people out here, you know, the stakeholders, uh, parents, uh, future students or politicians, uh, private companies, all these people who really want to get the good things out of our university because they trust us to do that. They want us to do that. But they're not really trusting our procedures. So I would say that the only way to get rid of that, the only way is to, to somehow regain trust among those thing, people. And regain trust means to build that discourse I talked about where we can show them, you know, you, you can stay calm. Look here, look here, look at these numbers, look at the, we're doing this, we're doing this, we have all this in place, it's working, so you don't really have to bother, you know, we're okay, we're okay. That would mean that we would regain our, the trust among these people and they would let us operate on our own terms. But it sounds much like a dream, I must say, when I say it. So it's just a hypothesis, it might not be true, right? Okay. So thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, really nice to be here. Thank you very much.